Good afternoon, North Dakota. Uh, beautiful day today, and I hope uh, wherever you are watching, you're healthy and safe. Uh, we've got a lot of good news uh, today that we're going to uh, zip through, but let me just uh, start out and remind people of why we're here doing these COVID press briefings. Uh, <clears throat> COVID is a 19 is a disease that does not spread risk evenly. It affects people with underlying health conditions and age, uh, sometimes with high degrees of mortality, as we discussed last week uh, of the cases in North Dakota, uh, those that are over age 70 uh, who were positive and had underlying health conditions, uh, the mortality rate was 14%. Those that are over 80 and contracted uh, <clears throat> COVID-19, uh, it was a 24% mortality rate. So a very uh, dangerous and potentially deadly disease for people with, with uh, age or underlying health conditions. Today, when we were on the call with the Vice President Pence, uh, <clears throat> the he, uh, of course, himself said, as he often does, that he wanted to express his gratitude uh, to the American people on behalf of the president and the entire administration for everything that the American people have done to help slow the spread and flatten the curve in accomplishing the goal uh, for the majority of the co country, uh, as we have here in North Dakota, where health care was not overwhelmed. Uh, this is especially true here. Uh, and I want to also thank, as I have uh, at every one of these uh, briefings, every North North Dakotan who's exercised their individual responsibility to care for themselves and their loved ones and have acted in a way that's North Dakota smart. When we talk about vulnerable populations, uh, the uh, in, in more detail because as more data emerges, uh, and Dr. Burks went through these on the call today, uh, but if you've got a uh, chronic lung disease, uh, as 5% of North Dakotans do, uh, serious heart conditions, 4%. If you're a cancer patient and might have uh, been undergoing uh, any kind of uh, chemo or radiation that will compromise your immune system, that's 10% of North Dakotans, 8.9% of North Dakotans with di di uh, diabetes. Uh, uh, and we've got uh, the <clears throat> uh, smokers, 18.4% of North Dakota, and sadly that number uh, still uh, higher than, of course, it, we'd like it to be uh, from a public health standpoint. And then one thing which North Dakota also unfortunately sometimes tops the list based on body mass indexes, 35% uh, of people in North Dakota have got uh, some level of obesity, including severe obesity. The population in North Dakota over age 65 among the highest of any state because of the long lives that people live here and, and then remain here, uh, remain living here, but it's 15.3%. Uh, uh, so some of those top numbers of conditions fall with people that are under age 65. If you have uh, one or more of those conditions and you're over 65, uh, that would be the uh, category of age plus multiple comorbidities that's put people at the highest amount of risk. Uh, if you, as we've said before early on, uh, at these uh, briefings even several months ago. Uh, it's a conservative estimate that 20% of the population of North Dakota is someone that would either have a combination of being over age 65 and one or more of these conditions. That is 20% of the 700 and, uh, 60,000 citizens that we have uh, means that, <clears throat> that we're talking about over 150,000, over 150,000 people that would fall in that category of most vulnerable. If you're fortunate enough to be uh, young and healthy and COVID is not as much of a threat to you, threat to you from a health standpoint, uh, you still, as we know, have the ability to be a pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, carrier and could uh, transmit this uh, <clears throat> Uh, to someone who ha who falls in the condition of being vulnerable and therefore uh, creating a real life risk for them. Uh, this is why several months ago we created the, the VP3, the Vulnerable Population Protection Plan, as we called it, uh, led by Chris Jones. Chris is here today, will be available for questions at the end of uh, today's uh, presentation. We, again, uh, you know, then again, this is sort of beginning with the why. Why are we, why are we doing what we're doing? We're doing this, uh, 
again, to help protect those that are most vulnerable. One of the ways that we can all do that, and again, thank you for all of you who've acted North Dakota smart throughout this thing, but you know, just the basic things that we talk about, uh, you, maybe you were doing a great job of washing your hands a few months ago. Uh, it's still a good idea to keep washing your hands, hand hygiene helps slow the spread, avoid uh, touching your, your face because whether it's your nose, your mouth, or your eyes is places where you can both uh, transmit it to your hands or transmit it to yourself. Uh, covering your mouth and nose with a mask uh, in appropriate conditions can help slow the spread, cleaning and disinfecting surfaces, and of course keeping appropriate distance as we go back uh, to events, outdoor events and large gatherings. These are all ways that you can protect yourself and your loved ones. So thanks for those of you that, that uh, participate and do this because you are helping us uh, slow the spread of this deadly contagion. We, let's jump into the numbers, where we also have got a lot of good news in making good progress. Uh, today, the health department confirmed 40 additional cases out of 2,845 tests for a 1.4% uh, test uh, positive rate across all tests that were completed. Uh, and again, uh, we continue to have uh, more of those occurring uh, in Cass County. I believe today 28 of the 40 were in Cass County or 70% of the positives were in Cass County, uh, but Cass County's numbers also continue uh, to drop. Uh, we have now completed a test of 81,660 uh, unique North Dakotans, uh, and we have completed uh, 1,000, almost just under 120,000 tests all total. Uh, the, that testing produced uh, 2,941 positive cases. So over the entire pandemic, 3.6%, uh, that's for the, the whole run of this, uh, but again, Again, today's result 1.4, and over the last seven days, uh, the majority of our uh, of that trend line has been. Um, well below 2% and sometimes approaching 1%, so we're in good shape. In terms of the testing, uh, we remain in the top five states in the nation, behind Rhode Island, New York, New Mexico, and New Jersey. Uh, New York and New Jersey uh, in particular have really ramped up their testing as they're coming out the backside of that uh, huge, devastating uh, loss of life in the New York metro area. And then why do we focus on testing and why does it matter that we have this testing capacity? Again, we want to remind ourselves the way we re rebuild our economy, uh, the way we reopen our schools and our universities, and the way we get a chance to visit our loved ones in long-term care. Testing is a tool that helps move us down that path uh, and keep, keep us moving forward in a positive direction. Uh, we have began reporting a couple weeks ago serial tests. Uh, we'll show the slide on that again in today's uh, testing of 2,845. Uh, just under 1,994 were newly tested North Dakotans and 1,851 repeats or serial tests and many of those uh, repeats again occurring for healthcare workers. Uh, or residents of long-term care or other congregate living. Uh, when we take a look at the net case breakdown, as I said, with the 40 new cases today, we also have got 32 that are newly recovered. Sadly, uh, one more death reported, uh, <clears throat> and that would be an individual, uh, a woman in her 80s from Cass County who had underlying uh, health conditions who passed with COVID-19. Uh, <clears throat> and as always, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with with her and her loved ones over her loss and all the loved ones of those 73 individuals who've passed with COVID during this, this pandemic. Uh, we are, of course, pleased to see that we've got uh, 2,482 individuals who have recovered. Uh, we have 33 people hospitalized, uh, only of which 10 are which in I ICU. So again, we've got continue to preserve and maintain and have great capacity for dealing at the highest level of care for anyone who may uh, come down with, with, with COVID. Uh, <clears throat> The 386 uh, active confirmed cases, again, con that's the number that continues to drop, and the fewer active cases we have in the state, uh, the easier it is for us to uh, control and slow uh, the spread of other people uh, <clears throat> becoming infected, so nice to see that number coming down, uh, well down from its peak. In terms of the active cases uh, in testing, uh, 
here we are, we, we can see here that we're, uh, you can see this flattening out was uh, close to 700 a few weeks ago and now down at that 386. On the positive rate of completed tests, uh, again, the bottom line represents the entire state. Uh, we're again, a nice slope. Uh, it's very low in the first place on this scale. Again, uh, from over two now, you know, down into the, the mid ones for the, for the orange line on the bottom. Uh, again, recognize that, <clears throat> that as a state, uh, we were fortunate we never bore the full brunt uh, of this pandemic. Uh, states that were that did meet the full force of this uh, had and sometimes uh, positive test rates as high as in the 40 percent in the 40 percent range. And uh, we were never, never in that kind of position. Uh, but we were always in good shape and now we're in better shape. Cass County, uh, where our largest uh, metro area uh, was where we've had the majority of the uh, outbreaks occurring, uh, has always been in better shape than uh, other metro areas of similar size uh, and similar demographic mix. Uh, and it too has shown great progress in bringing the the, bringing the line down and keeping the line down. Uh, we continue to do uh, a lot of work with the CAS uh, or the uh, CAS Clay, the Red River Valley COVID Task Force and continuing to work. Uh, and again, want to thank uh, all the, the mayors, the local officials and CAS County Public Health and others as we continue to work together with the state resources uh, to wrestle that to the ground in CAS County. <clears throat> Uh, a testing update, uh, we've talked a lot about testing as being the key. Uh, we're at a point where the numbers are coming down uh, in terms of the testing, but we also have seen that there's been a drop off in demand of people that want to get tested. Uh, for us to keep doing the things that we want to do in terms of rebuilding and reopening the economy, uh, reopening schools and universities and visiting our loved ones, uh, we need to make sure we keep our eye on, on, uh, on testing. And one of the things that was talked about today on the call with Dr. Burks is the need for more surveillance testing. And surveillance testing would be testing people who might be pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, versus those uh, that are not feeling well and really feel like, hey, I'm getting sick and I think I'm sick and I'm going to get a test. So again, early on, uh, we were not testing people who were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic because of short of testing supplies. Now, when we've built our capacity up to uh, over 4,000 tests a day, anytime when we're not uh, utilizing all of that test capacity in our lab, that's an opportunity for us to get out and do more surveillance testing or do pilot projects uh, for things like uh, testing visitors to, uh, to long-term care facilities. So our testing uh, team and the leadership uh, is working hard on this. And one of the places that we're kicking this off is working with our North Dakota Department of Health and the city of Fargo uh, has announced they'll be holding two COVID-19 testing events for the general public tomorrow, Thursday, and and Friday, and these are walk up, drive up. <clears throat> uh events uh, and they'll take place from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. tomorrow and 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Friday in the west parking lot of the Fargo Dome. This testing is open to the general public uh, and anyone uh, that may come. If you are uh, someone who has not been tested yet but you are wondering, uh, if you're someone is uh, uh, that is saying, hey, I'd like to potentially you know, consider a visit to long-term care. Uh, I know that I went to some large gatherings, whether that was the Red River Valley Speedway last Last week, or whether that was a uh, demonstration or protest, whether it was a graduation, a wedding, um, a, a funeral, a church. I mean, if you've been around uh, public and say, "Hey, I want to be, I want to be tested," uh, you just just show up uh, on those two days. Uh, we're planning a similar, and, and again, we're planning to do this on this Thursday and Friday, but we're also planning to do it on Thursday and Friday for the next three weeks. The reason why we're choosing Thursday and Friday for the surveillance testing. Uh, is because then those tests will arrive at our lab on the weekend, and the weekend is one of the places that we've found that we generally have got more capacity because there's less uh, less people uh, seeking medical care that's been around since before the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people, they don't feel on a weekend, they don't feel well, they wait till Monday morning to go in. Same thing was happening during this. So again, scheduling surveillance testing events uh, on Thursdays and Fridays, we'll start doing that around the state to help uh, use that 
capacity that we have uh, at the lab on weekends. So Bismarck, Grand Forks, and Minot, uh, similar uh, tests will be coming. Uh, the health Department is working with local public health units to determine testing locations in those three cities. We hope to that have that in place uh, next week and have that going by next Thursday and Friday for those other metro areas. Uh, at the Fargo Dome, uh, Fargo Cast Public Health will be working in partnership with the North Dakota Department of Health and the North Dakota National Guard, who continues to serve uh, in this uh, public health uh, emergency. Appointments are not required. But if you wish to receive a test, uh, you're strongly encouraged to complete the online screening questionnaire in advance, uh, which can be found at testreg, testreg.nd.gov. And if you do that, that will help speed up uh, your time when you're actually at the facility, because if you do that on a mobile phone, I believe it gives you a QR code that they can scan, uh, which will help speed your uh, speed you through the testing process. The the testing itself uh, will should only take uh, 15 minutes, uh, but it is uh, the wait time may be longer. So if you want to shorten up that wait time, fill out the uh, the on the screening ahead of time on testreg.nd. Uh, Good news on this, no cost for the test. Health insurance not required uh, and not processed. Proof of residency is not required. So if you are someone that is, uh, is you know, visiting, if you're someone who lives on the, on the Moorhead side of the metro area, uh, you can still get a test. Uh, those numbers will be uh, allocated to their place of living, but we want to be in a position to test anybody. We're interested in finding uh, positives wherever they may fall in the metro uh, region, or if if you just happen to be in Fargo for the weekend and you uh, live in Wapaton or Hillsboro or, or Castleton, if you're there, feel free to drive in and go for a test because we're happy to test people from the region as well. Uh, so proof of residency being a Far Fargo or a Cass County resident is not a requirement. Uh, if you get a positive result, uh, we, we will strive to be notifying uh, people within 24 hours of when we find out that result. Uh, Negatives, of which we have thousands a day. Uh, we're working on a process to streamline when we notify negatives, uh, but negatives uh, generally, uh, we're, our, our commitment is to try to get people notified within 72 hours. Uh, but uh, positives, uh, of course, go first because those are the people that we want to either treat or isolate. Uh, for people who are wondering about the the testing, uh, this is going to be with oral swabs. Uh, is uh, kind of like when you they would do the. Uh, you know, like a strep throat test on the on your on the back of your throat, so relatively easy. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> antibody testing is not going to be conducted. These are the PCR tests that will be run through the lab. And last note: testing must individuals must be at least 12 years old. And again, this aligns with the the CDC uh, and the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force and Dr. Burke's call for more surveillance testing, uh, more walk-up testing to be available. So anyone uh, that wants to get tested can get tested and again that starts uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. at the uh, Fargo Dome coming to other cities next week. Next topic is uh, long-term care. Last Friday uh, I signed an executive order that modified uh, and started opening up the restrictions on visitation for long-term care facilities. And this was allowed for a planned phased approach to resuming uh, full visitation as outlined in our, in our vulnerable population protection plan. Uh, I, I want to commend uh, Chris Jones and all the folks working on the VP3 plan uh, for the great work that they're doing. Uh, what the work that's happening here in North Dakota, uh, both that, that has occurred around uh, testing uh, in long-term care. Uh, one of the first states in the nation to test every resident in long-term care. We've tested all the healthcare workers in long-term care. We're working our way back around for a second wave of testing through all of that. And so again, uh, we uh, intend to lead the nation in terms of being among the first to safely reopen visitation uh, to those that are in congregate living and whether that's in skilled nursing, basic care, or assisted living. Uh, as you know, we uh, early on uh, restricted uh, our uh, visitation uh, way back on April 6th. And I, I know that some people, this has been challenging for people to be away from loved ones, uh, but I would also steer people back uh, to the numbers uh, because uh, over 32,000 individuals in this nation have died uh, 
as part of and well residing in a long-term care facility had died with COVID. Uh, and even right next door uh, in Minnesota, uh, of their nearly 1,200 deaths, 968 of those have been uh, in long-term care. In contrast, uh, in North Dakota, 53 of the 70 uh, two deaths that we've had have been in long-term care. So again, uh, Minnesota does have seven times more population, but uh, if, if they were on par, uh, Minnesota's long-term care deaths would look at, looked like 350, not 968, if we were, if it was compared to North Dakota. So again, I wanna thank everybody in long-term care in North Dakota for doing a great job of advocating and protecting uh, for the physical health of their residents. And we know now that uh, there are lots of folks, we've said all along, that's why we've created concluded a behavioral health update every single day uh, throughout this uh, is that we know that the health of all of us and particularly those in long-term care uh, that, that that the social connection the family connection with loved ones uh, the 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 actual physical connections of of being with those loved ones matters in their health and that's why uh, this is the uh, utmost urgency of our team to continue to try to be among the first in the nation to safely reopen uh, visitation among long-term care. That amended order that I signed on Friday that allows for this phased approach, uh, it's based on a couple of factors. One, it's based on the prevalence of COVID-19 in the county. So we're tracking how much uh, how much, how many pauses there are in the county and the number of active COVID-19 cases among the residents. Uh, excluded in that gating factor is, is a positive among a staff person because a staff person can re be removed and isolated easily. Uh, and so once those are found and they're out of the, out of the, the mix, so to speak, uh, we wanna be able to keep going forward. We've pulled together a team. Uh, Chris described that uh, last week. Uh, these are people with uh, deep backgrounds in long term care and in nursing uh, and they're working uh, again seven days a week uh, with the 218 uh, long-term care facilities in North Dakota uh, to get people into entering into phase one and happy to report that 96 of the 218 uh, are, have been approved to enter phase one. That excludes 40 skilled nursing, 24 basic care, and 32 assisted living. We also on Friday announced uh, the availability and have strongly encouraged outdoor visitation by appointment with appropriate social distancing, with personal protective equipment, including masks and we've heard some great success stories about reunification and I want to share some of those but I also want to say we've I've heard from some citizens also saying that they had some frustrating experiences we'll follow up on those uh, and again uh, continue to work with long-term care to try to make sure that we can make uh, the reunification, uh, out the outdoor pieces of this, which can proceed right now, uh, be as helpful and productive and as, as possible. But right here at St. Gabriel's uh, in Bismarck, we had a, a wonderful story that was shared by that 102 year old Alex Mugley, uh, who lives in assisted living, uh, and 91 year old Alice Mugley, his wife, uh, lived in skilled nursing, but those are two separate facilities. They were reunited after not seeing each other for nearly three months. Uh, they, during that time apart, uh, they passed the date and celebrated their 73rd wedding anniversary separately uh, with their daughter, Sheila. They just this uh, last few days spent an outdoor visit all together, uh, laughing and enjoying each other's company. Uh, and Alice said, oh my goodness, seeing her husband Alex for the first time in three months felt so good. I missed him so much. So again, uh, happy 73rd wedding anniversary to Alex and Alice. And uh, thank you to uh, St. Gabriel's and others for uh, this uh, fun sharing of story of reuniting this couple again, 73 years of marriage. Congratulations. Uh, <clears throat> Another story came from Elmcrest Manor, which is a, a skilled nursing facility in, in New Salem, North Dakota. Uh, family member uh, uh, of, of a resident there uh, had sent in uh, this note. Uh, and again, this is Elmcrest Manor had reached phase one of the North Dakota Smart Restart Plan for long-term care. And Angie Dahl, their family wrote, visiting our loved one during the COVID-19 pandemic was stressful. Uh, and, and even though we visit her often, but through the window. She would often invite us to come inside and we'd have to say no. That was heartbreaking, especially because she didn't understand why we couldn't come in. When we were finally able to have our 
first outdoor visit, it was overwhelming to see the smile on her face and hear her say what a wonderful surprise it was. For the first time in months, she recognized us and as it was a challenge to know who was visiting at the window. We look forward to the advancement in phases so that soon we will have, be able to have a meal with her and spend quality time together. And I know that we got families all over the state that are looking forward uh, to those kinds of reunions. Uh, I wanna also say again uh, from uh, calls that we had uh, yesterday uh, and and over the weekend and uh, this morning again, uh, our team here, uh, Unified Command, uh, Department of Health, the testing and contact tracing team uh, are all committed uh, to also working on a pilot to take the extra testing capacity, which we have uh, to figure out how we can get testing done uh, on a pilot basis, uh, because one of the ways to uh, ad advance uh, through the gating uh, would be to test all visitors in a way, the same way that we're testing all long-term care workers so that a visit by a family member would represent no more risk than a visit from a uh, from the, someone who's working in the facility. And so again, uh, continuing to work diligently on this and we'll uh, post you, uh, keep posting you on any updates we have on that front. Next topic is uh, the our behavioral health section. COVID-19, I think we all know has been uh, changing life for all of us and for people that have had disruptions, uh, whether it's uh, concerns about a loved one in long-term care, whether it's concerns about employment, uh, whether you're a business owner and you're concerned about uh, your your balance sheet and your financial situation, uh, or whether you're uh, you know, someone in uh, energy who's dealing with low oil prices or you're a farmer that's dealing with uh, the, the current stress in the ag world and farm stress as, they, as it's called, uh, you certainly have reasons reasons to be feeling anxious, stressed, worried, sad, depressed, lonely, uh, and frustrated during these times. But recognizing the signs and symptoms of stress are important uh, to make sure that, that you get the support that you, a loved one, or a coworker, or a neighbor may be needing. And some signs and symptoms of stress, because stress can be uh, uh, early indicators of more serious issues, uh, whether that will be uh, you know, mental health issues such as depression, which need to be treated as you know, progressive and, and uh, diseases that can can lead to uh lead to serious consequences, including death. And so we need to, as North Dakotans, start to understand that uh, when we see uh, our physical health decline, we generally know that's time to see a doctor. When we see our mental health decline, uh, again, this is sometimes where people think it's time to be North Dakota tough. Uh, we want people to be North Dakota smart about mental health and behavioral health as well. So signs and symptoms that can include if uh, someone uh, starts uh, showing up to work less often than usual, uh, greater use of substances such as uh, alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. Uh, because again, sometimes when people are having all these other stresses, uh, self-medication as it's called uh, with addictive substances can only com you know, compound the problem. People that might become more emotional, more moody, or more uh, reactive to what others say, uh, changing of sleep patterns or eating, which is either rapid weight loss or gain, uh, physical reactions that you might be experiencing or observing among your loved ones, sweating, palpitations, uh, blood pressure, headaches, stomach pains, sudden chronic back pain, people feeling negative, depressed, anxious, feeling trapped or frustrated, believing there's no solution, increased irritability, poor concentration, reduced productivity, uh, deteriorating personal or work relations, uh, increased bullying, sarcasm, negativity, self-doubt, uh, fidgety movements, bouncing legs, tapping figures, r rubbing materials, or just isolating. Uh, sometimes the best indicator that someone is dealing with a lot of stress is behavior that is just opposite their normal behavior. When a normally outgoing, charismatic person suddenly becomes sullen or quiet, it may be a nonverbal sign the person is dealing with stressful situation. Uh, we not only care about people that may be, uh, for all kinds of good reasons, experiencing these things, uh, we know from a survey done uh, earlier uh, during the isolation of the, uh, during the, uh, when people were, were more isolated across our nation during COVID, that there was a dramatic uptick uh, in concerns about uh, mental and behavioral health. Uh, we announced last week that we were launching Project Renew, uh, projectrenew.nd.gov. Have some information coming up here. Uh, it's available and it's, uh, 
free support services to those who might be experiencing uh, what are really natural feelings in the wake of this pandemic, but these are free and they're anonymous to all North Dakotans. Uh, it's provided by our community partner, Lutheran Social Services, but if you call 701-223-1510, you have an opportunity to talk to a trained counselor, and again, you don't have to share uh, who you are, uh, where you live, uh, but if, you have, if you're feeling uh, intense difficulty, distress, or trouble, or if you just need someone to talk to, again, reach out to projectrenew.nd.gov uh, or call 701-223-1510 uh, and call now. Don't delay if you've got a concern. And again, thanks to our behavioral health team at the North Dakota uh, Department of Human Services uh, for launching this program. Uh, next up, uh, we wanna talk about uh, your wellness uh, during this time. And part of that wellness is your regular checkup. Uh, and we know that lots of people may have uh, delayed or postponed uh, or not gone in to see their medical provider uh, during this time frame because of concerns about COVID. Uh, but there's a number of things that uh, that that you need to do to take care of your, yourself and your family. And if you've put those off, now's the time to re-engage. I'm happy to have back with us on the stage today. She's been here before, but Dr. Joan Connell the field medical officer with the health department uh, to talk about immunizations and well checks. She knows this well from her own practice, but again, uh, Dr. Connell, great to have you here. Thanks so much, Governor Burgum, and good afternoon. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been an alarming decrease in immunizations and well checks. This has resulted in decreased immunizations and delays in obtaining appropriate screening tests and referrals for care that are vital to making sure children and adults are healthy and thriving. According to the North Dakota Immunization Information System, there has been a 15% decrease in the number of doses of vaccine administered to children from 2019 to 2020. As you can see in this graph, week 12 was the week after North Dakota's first case of COVID. Many healthcare facilities across North Dakota are getting creative to modify their systems to help parents and patients feel more comfortable about coming in and reducing the risk of exposure to COVID-19. Examples include facilities separating sick patients from well patients, scheduling them at different times of the day, or completing many of the components of a well check using telehealth, which limits the office visit portion of the well check to tests, assessments, and immunizations that have to be done in person. Some local public health units are conducting drive-through vaccinations. For more information on the safety measures being taken by your facility, contact your health care provider or your local public health unit. With the current COVID-19 pandemic in the United States and across the world, the importance of vaccines and maintaining immunization rates has become even more critical. Immunization rates must reach 95% in order to keep diseases from spe spreading if introduced into a child care facility or school. Once rates fall below that 95% threshold, child care facilities and schools become vulnerable to outbreaks of disease. According to the North Dakota Immunization Information System, immunization rates for measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine were 86.1% last year at this time and are currently down to 83.8%. Having vaccine preventable diseases and COVID-19 circulating within facilities at the same time could potentially lead to a large number of closures and worse, adversely affect the health of our children. Just a reminder that North Dakota Century Code does mandate children attending child care and school be up to date on their immunizations. Children must be kept up to date per the requirements for their age group. North Dakota universities also require certain immunizations. These requirements will not be loosened or delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Costs should not be a barrier to immunization. 
the Vaccines for Children program in North Dakota is a federal entitlement program that provides vaccines at no cost to healthcare providers for children who are 18 or younger and Medicaid eligible, uninsured, underinsured, or American Indian, Alaskan Native children. Parents should ask their healthcare provider or local public health unit about the VFC program. A couple of additional considerations. Don't forget that adults need vaccines too. Adults are also encouraged to contact their health care provider or local public health unit about their needed vaccines, including tetanus, pneumococcus, and shingles. And please speak with your health care provider to keep up to date on any health screenings that you might need, including mammograms and colorectal cancer screenings. Now, when our COVID rates are low in so many parts of the state, is a great time to get up to date on all your preventive health needs. It might seem early, but please pick a day this fall before Halloween and put a reminder on your calendar for you and your family to get the flu vaccine. The influenza vaccination will be more important than ever. It'll be difficult to differentiate between influenza and COVID without testing and this will place an additional burden on healthcare providers. Also, we do not want flu hospitalizations on top of COVID hospitalizations. Remember that hospital capacity is a key component of North Dakota Smart Restart and keeping North Dakota open. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, only about 48% of North Dakotans get vaccinated against influenza each year. Let's continue to be North Dakota smart and socially responsible by keeping your vaccinations up to date. This simple act saves lives and the lives of others. That sounds like another opportunity to be a hero. For more information on immunizations, including a list of what immunizations are required, visit the health department website at health.nd.gov slash immunize. Thank you, and I'll be available for questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Connell. Millions of Americans uh, give blood every year. Unfortunately, concerns over COVID-19 have led to many canceled blood drives and lower donations this year compared to previous years. And I think uh, everybody is familiar that uh, over 5 million Americans every year need blood transfusions for a number of reasons, whether they're trauma or burn patients, premature infants, heart surgery patients, cancer patients. Uh, donating blood, uh, and I know many of you do this, it's an easy way to get back to your community and can literally also save lives. Today, uh, blood donation centers are working hard to ensure that the donation process is super safe. And they've also got some good news. This is in the news section. Saving lives, is that's a reason enough. Uh, but we want to give you another reason, uh, one more reason to roll up your sleeves. And it's not for a glass of juice or a cookie. Uh, but in early June, uh, Vitalant, which serves 70 hospitals across North Dakota, South Dakota, and Western Minnesota, became the first national blood bank to test all complete blood donations for COVID-19 antibodies for free, uh, which means another way of saying that is some people said, hey, how do I get an antibody test? Well, one way you can get an antibody test now is go to Vitalant, donate blood, and they will uh, give you the result of your antibody test as part of that. Antibodies, of course, are the proteins that your bodies create to fight an infection, and the presence of a COVID-19 antibodies in your blood uh, would let you know that if you may have previously had COVID-19. You may not even have known it if you were uh, young and healthy. Uh, but these antibody tests are part of a panel of tests that Vitalant conducts now on all complete blood donations and they will begin conducted for free uh, for for those blood donations that are completed uh, one of the things we talked about at a previous press conference is there is a new treatment called convalescent plasma treatment. Those that are hospitalized with COVID-19 uh, has shown some pro promise in early trials that if they get a donation of blood with COVID-19 antibodies, uh, it may help them fight off the disease. And so again, uh, if you donate uh, plasma to make this treatment possible for others. Uh, since Vitalant began their convalescent 
plasma treatment program. There have been 66 convalescent plasma products have been collected in North Dakota uh, from uh, individuals who previously tested positive and had developed antibodies. So I want to thank those individuals uh, that had the antibodies because uh, Vitalant will takes blood from would be happy to take blood for the general reasons uh, that we need blood transfusions. But even now, more than ever, you could even be more helpful to someone in need if you it turned out that your blood you're donating had these antibodies. Uh, as many individuals may be seeking antibody tests, this is again an opportunity to find out whether you've got antibodies or not, and you can find out for free. Uh, we encourage eligible North Dakotans to reach out to their local blood donation centers, schedule an appointment uh, to be a blood donor, help save lives, and find out if you have already had COVID-19. Uh, more good news, it just keeps coming, uh, and this has to do with the Heritage Center and the State Museum. They're announcing today the State Historical Society, which uh, operates the Heritage Center and the State Museum, uh, that they'll be reopened to the public on June 22nd. So just coming up here in a few weeks. Hours for the Heritage Center will be from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on weekdays, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. on weekends. State archives will be open 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on weekdays and same 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. on the second Saturday of each month. There'll be new health and safety protocols that are in place for enhanced visit Visitor and staff safety. All visitors and staff will be subject to wellness screenings upon entering the building, encouraged to wear face coverings and follow social distance guidelines. Uh, and many uh, historic sites across the state have already been open. Many of those are out, outdoor locations to visit, uh, and they've been open for some time. We'd encourage you to go to the uh, North Dakota uh, to the website and check out those locations for the State Historical Society and pay, maybe add those to your uh, bucket list of things to visit this summer. Uh, but we're also very excited to be welcoming the public back indoors to the Heritage Center and the State Museum to learn more about this great state and the amazing people who have lived here. If you're in North Dakota, and have a North Dakotan who has never been uh, to the rebuilt Heritage Center where the legislature uh, stepped up uh, in recent years and built a world-class museum. Uh, it's a fantastic attraction. Uh, it, you can spend uh, hours or days there. If you and your kids have never had a chance to go there, uh, add it to your things to do if you're doing a driving trip around North Dakota this summer. Again, open uh, Monday through through. Uh, through, through to open seven days a week, uh, including 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. on weekends. So that's the State Historical Society and the Heritage Center and State Museum. So thank you for all the work you're doing over there. Uh, closing out uh, with uh, gratitude, uh, I want to start out again by uh, thanking uh, all of those individuals who worked hard uh, to support uh, the local election process across our state. We know this was an unusual year. Uh, and I want to thank the, uh, but there's still a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Local election officials uh, whose hard work supports our right to vote in our democratic system in every election. And we're grateful to uh, all that you've done uh, in this election to ensure the safety of our election officials and our voters. We're also grateful to the approximately, at least so far, ballots uh, in 155,000 North Dakotans who cast a ballot in this election. That makes it the highest primary voter turnout uh, since 2012. Uh, the right to vo vote and, the, and have a voice in our government is one of the fundamental rights as Americans. We're so fortunate to have it. Not everybody in the world does. And we're happy to see that so many North Dakotans, uh, even during this time of COVID, uh, exercised that right and fulfilled their civic duty. So again, election officials, and I know many of them are still working uh, as they're still receiving uh, ballots that are coming in. So thank you all for the work that you're, you're doing. Uh, closing uh, in a gratitude quote, uh, <clears throat> American pastor John Ortberg said, gratitude is the ability to experience life as a gift. And I, I think when we take a look at uh, North Dakota and whether it's our uh, economy uh, coming back, uh, whether it's the way we've m been able to manage and avoid the full brunt of this pandemic, uh, the, the way it is when we look forward with optimism about our schools and our universities and reconnecting with our elders. There's so many things for us to be positive and looking forward to, and uh, we can always be thankful that we're here in North Dakota uh, in uh, this incredible state uh, in the greatest uh, 
country in the world. So again, uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Ortberg. Gratity, gratitude is the ability to experience life as a gift. Uh, I know that I feel that way every day as a gift, and uh, we want to make the most of every day. So with that, I want to say thank you also for the gift of your time uh, that are watching uh, into these, uh, as you have been so faithfully across all of these uh, uh, press briefings uh, with things moving in the right direction. Uh, we're going to step back to uh, doing these weekly. So we'll be here Tuesday at 3.30. We're going to try to shoot as Tuesday as our weekly uh, briefing. And uh, and, and we, of course, will be doing a daily press releases, uh, the 11 a.m. report with the, uh, with the numbers report and other press releases will be going out as uh, required uh, as we talk about other changes and other progress, other things that we're progressing. But again, we'll be doing the live briefing now once a week next Tuesday at 3.30. Until then, uh, remain uh, North Dakota smart. Thank you for what you're doing and your part in helping uh, North Dakota stay healthy and stay connected and, and to help help us uh, navigate through this as well as any place uh, in the country. So again, thank you for that. And now we'll stand for questions. As I said, Dr. Connell's here to take questions and Chris Jones is here if there's any questions on the, the VP3. And the first hand going up goes to radio legend Dave Thompson. <laughs> Governor, you started with you know some of the procedures that you, the procedure we've been talking about since day one. Are you concerned that people might be slacking off a little bit because we're opening up, the weather's getting nicer, people are moving more, other states are opening up, and you're seeing almost all 50 states have some kind of opening? Yeah, I, th I think uh, compliance fatigue is a real is a real thing, and. And I just want to say again, North Dakotans did a fantastic job. We acted early and quickly, uh, and and I would say sometimes a, a success. Uh, can breed complacency. We were very successful in keeping the numbers low in North Dakota. We've been very successful in keeping uh, COVID-19 out of long-term care facilities. Uh, we've been very successful in keeping the number of people who've passed with COVID down in terms of you know some of the best numbers in the country. Well, if you went through this whole thing and you don't know anybody that either got sick, got very ill, was hospitalized, was in an ICU, was on a ventilator, maybe they were near death, or you know, or you've attended the funeral, you're one of those loved ones of someone who passed away from this. If you don't know any of those people, which is very possible in our state, then you're kind of saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I think we're good. We, you know, we did our thing, we're, we're, let's move on. Uh, Again, we have to sort of look at the at the numbers. It's probably easier for me when I'm on a call multiple times a week with other governors when when you've got other states where, you know, they're celebrating that they're down from having, uh, you know, a thousand people die in a day down to hundreds of people die in a day. You know, that is a... Uh, you know, it's hard to even think about that uh, when you, you think about that some states uh, ha have not resumed any indoor dining yet. I mean, they're talking about opening up dining, you know, later on this summer. They're talking about, you know, groups and things that, that you know, hurdles that we passed on May 1st, they're hoping for July 1. So so we, we've got a, I can't imagine how difficult it would be in those states to have compliance fatigue if you've got, uh, you know, trying to hold uh, everything <clears throat> uh, locked down for, for months and months where we had, again, very light touch of government and a very strong amount of individual responsibility. Having said that, uh, I uh, am with the amount of surveillance testing we have planned, the capacity we have, the plans for reopening visitation. I'm hoping that we can just keep uh, increasing the amount of economic activity, uh, educational activity, uh, family connectedness activity. We can keep increasing that with a lot of optimism and confidence and do it in a way where we're, we're not, we don't end up uh, sort of back at, at the starting line where we would end up with particularly, you know, a, like a large breakout in a long-term care facility, which we know when, when you know, that's, that's even happened as we now know across the river in Moorhead, where there was 15 deaths in one facility. I mean, we've avoided that here. We want to continue to avoid that uh, and uh, as we continue to work. But I think your question, Dave, is spot on. There is, there's a real, real, real concern here for that, but I'm, I'm optimistic we're going to keep making it through. Jacob? Then, uh, when comparing other states and when they're reopening, many of these other states had a definitive first spike to deal with first. North Dakota hasn't really had that moment. Is it your belief that the state avoided it completely? Well, I, I don't say 
completely because we don't know what's going to happen next fall or next winter. But uh, I mean, when you take a look at at, at North Dakota, where uh, you know some of the early action we took, I mean, we we it was uh, first case. I believe came on a Wednesday. We had a press conference on Thursday morning. There was uh, some schools weren't open that Friday because it was a closed school day, and that Sunday night we closed schools, and the and and that was uh, so you could say within you know for some one school day, two school days of the first case. I mean, there were states that was a month after the first case that they're like, maybe we should close schools. By that time, you know, as we saw, things really got out of hand in some places and then they were really dealing with it. So we're, I think part of it was, uh, you know, quick, smart action early uh, is probably one of the things that, that created the success. And when we have that kind of success, then people might uh, incorrectly assume that it was uh, there was you know there was never a problem as opposed to North Dakota handled it in a, in a smart way and I and again I would thank you know er everybody I mean you know business owners school leaders long term care citizens I mean this was a team effort for the whole state uh, that that uh, jumped on it and most of it was individual responsibility as opposed to uh, government action so I, I, North Dakota's got to feel good about it but we're like we're uh, things are looking good summer's good but we have to be ready we've talked before nineteen. 18 uh, flu epidemic more people died in October than they did during March uh, that's a real possibility but we're also really building up our capability around uh, the testing and the contact tracing and the isolation which I think is those are tools that we did not have uh, when back in March they are tools that we do have now and we want to uh, keep building those capabilities to be ready for so we can successfully open uh, in the fall. We've had good conversations with uh, university leaders, a great call yesterday with Dr. Wynn, uh, who's both uh, working in this role as the chief health strategist, but he's also in his role uh, on the university system working on how to reopen the, uh, reopen the, the the, the schools, because again, congregate living is we know is an issue, whether it's long term care. Well, where else are we going to have congregate living? We're going to have congregate living in dorms. I mean, one of the things where we probably got a little bit, you know, it's always lucky the way the timing of this thing happened was right around spring break. And we had over 40,000 university students that went on spring break and didn't come back. You know, if they were all back and all living in dorms when this thing took off, we could have been dealing with issues on universities like uh, some other places may have been. Uh, we didn't have that issue, but we want to uh, start thinking about how do we how do we build the testing capacity and again working on some pilot ideas this summer. You know, maybe first with uh, with sports teams because we have a lot of student athletes that come from a lot of different states to all of our our uh, the 11 public and two private universities in our state. So again, we're we're going to just we even though the positive rate is down. There's a lot of work that we can be doing right now to make sure that we don't have this second bump that you're talking about. I'm going to Scott Hennon in the back and then we're going to go online and then back over to Jack and then to Lane. Scott, good to, good to see you in person. Going to one day a week, I think, is kind of where a lot of people would say, hey, I've done the same thing, right? I spent all my time on this, now a little less time on this, and now, uh, you know, a day a week. And obviously, for obvious reasons, the testing would say we're doing our job. What do you do with that time that you get back? What are the priorities beyond COVID and so all, all, you know, all, of the, all of the things dealing with keeping people safe? What, what things are on your to-do list uh, ahead of that from all the impacts that will remain for years? Well, I'd say that, you know, the three big buckets that are, you know, out in front of us that we've been dealing with in kind of what I call emergency crisis mode, which is, you know, far from over. But one is the public health crisis. Uh, and we still have to continue to put a lot of time, as you know, into safely reopening long term care, working on getting schools and universities reopened. So we we're I don't see the. We may have less briefings, but the amount of hours we're putting into this across all the teams, the Unified Command, that's not changing. I mean, everybody's still working around the clock. Second one is on the economic recovery. And of course, uh, great work by our Commerce Department, Bank of North Dakota, uh, and all the things there. And of course, we've still got dollars to allocate from the, uh, the, the coronavirus federal dollars that came into the state. We've got an emergency commission meeting uh, next uh, Thursday, uh, which will be followed by a budget section meeting where we're continuing to work with the legislative leaders uh, to make sure that we're spending those dollars that, that we're giving us to, by the Fed in a way that makes sense for North Dakota. So a lot of work on the economic recovery. Uh, as I know, and you've spent time on this too, what I would call the uh, the opportunity uh, 
just like we had an opportunity coming out of the code access pipeline protests uh, to have that be the beginning of a, a new era of, of uh, understanding and engagement with the tribal nations in our state. Uh, we've got an opportunity uh, in terms of uh, what I'll call, uh, you know, justice, if you will, uh, you know, the civil unrest, the demonstrations we've seen, there's an opportunity for engagement there. Uh, that's a, it's a little different when we're doing tribal engagement. That is a sovereign government to a sovereign government when we're talking about, uh, you know, building stronger uh, communities uh, with equality and justice. That really involves, we got to get involved at the local level. I mean, that's, we're down to the city level uh, and all of the institutions within the cities. And so that's going to be a, a, a more layered uh, kind of effort to do that. But we're going to pour some energy uh, into that. And then we've got the regular running of state government, we've, which hasn't let up. I mean, whether it's the health department or the health department or the uh, uh, North Dakota Job Service or the Commerce Department, there have been more activity, more calls, you know, more hotline, more transactions, more anything you can imagine uh, going on in each of those agencies than there were before. And the same thing here, we've had more emergency commission meetings, we've had more uh, industrial commission meetings. Uh, so the, the sort of the basic running of government uh, has not let up. We've been doing all that in the background through all this and that's gonna continue to go. So I, I wish I could tell you that there was a, uh, you know, I mean, what I might do with my time is get a few more hours of sleep, but I don't, I don't, see, I don't see this thing letting up uh, for us right now because we've gotta stay a very focused uh, on the economy and very focused on, on uh, you know, trying to manage our way, our way through this thing. But I, I'd say the, the biggest thing that I'd like to carve off more time for is the opportunity for transformation because when we have a when you have this much disruption and this much chaos, particularly in terms of the core business processes of government, everything from, you know, how we teach a college class to how you get, renew your driver's license, you know, the digital transformation is happening. People have experienced it. They've seen what the challenges are and what the possibilities are. And I think it's, I think it's accelerated uh, the, digital, the digital transformation, which has completely overtaken other industries, but was not overtaking education or core government. Uh, it will accelerate it in education and core government by at least a decade. To me, that's exciting because that means better services uh, for better, better services and better flexibility for, you know, for education. I mean, if you can get a college degree without having to stop your life for four years, if you can go back and complete a degree while you're working for a job and do that, you know, I mean, we, we have an opportunity actually to expand who we're delivering educational opportunities to in higher ed. We have a chance to make K-12, you know, better and stronger. So I, the thing, I mean, the thing I'm probably most energized about is the opportunities on the backside of this. And at least through my, uh, you know, 35 plus years in the business sector, there was huge disruptions like this. You know, one in the late 80s, the dot-com crash, then the uh, the financial crash of 2000, you know, 2008, 2009. I've been through three of these things where the economy is completely cratered. And each time when you've come out the other side, somebody, some organizations have accelerated and, um, and really benefited from that that chaos, and others just disappeared and went away. And we're, we don't have the option of going away. Government's here, but we got to, we have an opportunity to make it better. So, all in all, I'd say my energy level is super high about what can happen on the backside of this. <clears throat> Petrochem Arena was something uh, we had a lot of interest from uh, big name companies about coming here. Obviously, the price of oil has dropped out. Is that is that gone? I mean, the, is that still on the table? Do you same thing with egg processing? Any of those things that were sort of bubbling uh, before this uh, still an opportunity here? Value added, more important than ever. And I'd say this is one thing where I'm so grateful to have Brent Sanford as Lieutenant Governor, because uh, during this time frame, you know, Brent's uh, certainly been involved in all the big decisions we've made related to COVID, but he's also carved off hundreds and hundreds of hours to work on everything from, uh, you know, Coal Creek, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, carbon capture, whether it's ethanol, whether it's, uh, you know, value added, whether it's uh, the petrochem, whether it's ag processing. I mean, we, it's more important than ever. I mean, when we see our economy drop because of the forces we can't control, uh, because we're dependent on commodities that we sell around the world, uh, then this is why, again, as North Dakotans, we got to take, uh, you know, 
we can't control that. We can control whether we add value to the products here in North Dakota. That requires we've got to attract ca t capital and talent. So we've got to make sure that we've got a, a business climate in North Dakota where that capital wants to come here versus go someplace else. Like on Petrochem, these are uh, eight to $10 billion capital allocation decisions that are made on the planet every two or three years. Uh, you know, this has actually slowed down that decision maybe by a year because of the demand collapse uh, by the, the majors that would make that kind of capital, but I think it gives North Dakota a chance to actually become more competitive. We can improve our position of being a place that may be selected for value-added pet chem because we got a little more window, window of time here to do that. So uh, those things are all more important than ever. I think I was going online, and then I was then I was going uh, Jack, then Lane, and then Jeremy. Okay, online. Mike Smith, 660 KUYZ in Williston. When can we expect to hear from Dr. Stahl and Dr. Wynn at one of these press conferences? Uh, I would I would say. Uh, <clears throat> Either, either soon, like in the coming weeks, uh, or we could schedule a separate one just for them. But I'd say uh, more, more likely that Dr. Wynn's a little further out because they're just getting the task force going and they're working on really more long-term things. Uh, Dr. Stahl uh, is, is, hasn't uh, been here at the podium because he's you know working you know, whatever, 80, 90, 100 hours a week in his new job. I talk to him every day and, and they're, they're grinding hard on all kinds of stuff. So excited about having both of those individuals on board, but uh, <clears throat> rest assured they're, uh, they're behind uh, most of the things that we're talking about here every day. Okay, batting order, was it Jack? Jack, then Jeremy? Okay. Uh, Morton County is reporting uh, no active cases. Um, how does the strategy change for a county that, you know, had a, surge of cases to begin with, they've leveled off or now have no more that are uh, confirmed to, to be positive when they're down to zero. Does, does that just change to uh, surveillance or what's the strategy for those types of counties? Well, I think there's there's two levels we've talked about on the map. On the <clears throat> for the the map for the general kind of what we'll call the risk levels are are five risk levels that we have and we're at the second lowest level, uh, which for some confusingly is green, uh, the lowest level is blue uh, <clears throat> as a just because green means go, I might have preferred that we had green on the bottom. This is just a personal comment, but uh, we are, uh, if any of you learned about the gentleman named Roy G. Biv when you were in in physics uh, in high school, but the color spectrum, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Uh, so anyway, we, we ended up using the first five of those. So we got Roy G. B. And so that's how we ended up with uh, green ahead of blue on the uh, color spectrum uh, so that it wouldn't, con if, 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 you're, if you're somehow a magical beast and you can actually see the colors of the spectrum when you're speaking, then you would know that our five risk levels are spectrum compliant. Uh, but anyway, we are in green, which means second level risk to get to blue we've kept that at a statewide level chris jones and the vulnerable you know the vp3 plan we have said that we are going to have one of the gating factors is county prevalence and so as we get through those gates we will have a map that will publish for long term care visitation where different counties will have different levels uh, morton county having zero uh, they're in a great position uh, relative to uh, certainly that, the VP3 plan, because that gating would be, you know, zero prevalence in a county uh, is, a, is a, one of the indicators for opening up long-term long -term care visitation. So that's positive. We haven't seen uh, a need yet in our state because the whole state's numbers are so low. Cass County is a little higher, but it's low relative to just about everything else in the country. And so again, we're moving the whole state to those risk levels together. The visitation will move county by county. To that, uh, Burley County has 24 uh, cases of it that are still active. Why, why do you think this region of the state has stayed relatively low? Uh, I, I can't, uh, I, would, I wouldn't want to just speculate on that without knowing the underlying. I mean, we've spent more time sort of digging into Cass than we have into Burley, but uh, it's a, uh, it's been it's been a very positive thing uh, again because we know right away that one of the outbreaks we had early on was here in Burley uh, that could have could have gotten uh, a little hotter than it did. So again, I would just credit that back to um, the people here in Burley County is one of those uh, one of those reasons. But when we say we've got none in Burley and none in Morton and you know 23 in Burley and we're 
and we've got a Mandan Bismarck uh, potential metro area, uh, I think we have to kind of treat that like Fargo Moorhead, which is, it's still in the community. You know, I don't know what the car count is going back and forth between the two counties every day uh, and the number of people that work in, work in Burley that live in Morton and vice versa. But I, I think again, we, we, when we, counties are useful for at some level, that's certainly how CDC collects data nationally, but on the reality on the ground, we have to think about these as how people as, as social economic Units and the metro areas is actually a more, more light, more a more useful thing for trying to understand that. Uh, Jeremy, I'm wondering how many tests will be available at the Fargo testing events per day. But uh, the answer to that, I'm going to just I, I don't have an answer, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell the team is as many as they need. Uh, and because we have got so many test collection kits uh, sitting on the shelf and we've got the capacity to do it. And uh, uh, if, if we've, we've moved some of our test collection uh, supplies, you know, t earlier as part of this uh, battle, you know, to Cass County, because that was where we had uh, more testing and more, uh, more uh, cases uh, going on. So they will have whatever they need. And uh, so if you're, Planning on going, and, and, and I well, I would say right now they're not going to run out because if they run out, we'll get them more. And then one follow up to that: um, the testing events here are on Thursday and Friday, 10 to 6. Most people are working during those times. Do you worry that there won't be accessibility to surveillance testing for people who have normal working hours? Uh, I, I I have. Uh, some concerns for that and we'll adjust as necessary. I've also got some concerns that they're, that, you know, locations like the Fargo Dome kind of imply that you have a car. Uh, and that's why, again, we're, we're, we know that, that not everybody has a car. We know that people in our metro areas take public transportation, but if you've got a, you can walk to the Fargo Dome, you can ride a bike to the Fargo Dome, you don't need a vehicle to get tested. Uh, it's, you know, beautiful this time of year. Uh, public transportation goes nearby there because it's, uh, goes up to the university. So again, we, encourage people to get there. And if you want to get tested and don't have a way to get to a facility again, I'd, I'd call, you know, call the health hotline and we can maybe help arrange transportation. If that's a barrier, we want, we want to eliminate barriers. I want to also remind people again on the, the ND response and the ND, uh, the ND health, North Dakota health website is uh, we've got locations in every city, medical providers, just because we're doing the thing at the Fargo Dome does not mean we're not stopping offering at all the other fixed locations, which is the clinics the hospitals in Fargo, the Family Health Care Center, I mean, all of those uh, will continue to offer uh, as they have been uh, for on-demand testing. But again, this would be for, for others that want to get tested. I'm going to Lane was next, then online, then Scott, then we'll come back to Jacob. Governor, with such a good turnout for the mail-in ballots, was wondering if you foresee that being more of a permanent thing with more uh, mail-in ballots or if people you think are going to return to in-person voting? Uh, I think that uh, some people f find that there's convenience to doing a mail-in ballot because they don't have to, again, whether it's before their workday, end of workday, wait in line. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been to polling places in my life in North Dakota where I've, you know, show up on election day after, you know, six o'clock, it's the last, you know, you know, hey, I'm voting, it's the day, the polls close and you stand in line for an hour and a half. I'm sure some people are happy to be uh, missing out on all that. Uh, but also, again, the key for us to have elections is to have accessibility for everybody. And I, I think I think you'll see North Dakotans desiring the idea to go back to having uh, uh, physical polling places as well as the mail-in. I think it's going to be a combination of the both of those two things. Uh, and I think if we, we ought to need to figure out how we can do that in a way where we can Make sure it's safe for the safe for the voters and safe for the for the the, the poll workers as well. And and again, I, I know that one of the concerns anybody who's ever voted in person knows that a lot of the volunteers that we had at the that worked at those polling centers, uh, you know, fit into some of the criteria that we had uh, here. Uh, they certainly fit into the over 65, and many of them had done it for decades. And if we're going to go back to physical polling, uh, probably need to do some recruiting to get uh, a, a new generation of poll workers, you know, trained and educated uh, as part of that part of that work to make sure we're protecting those those uh, great volunteers that may have been doing this for for decades. But I, I would see us having a combination. We'll always have a combination. We got military people serving overseas. We need to have absentee ballot process. And basically we just greatly expanded the absentee ballot process here. I'm sure when the dust settles, uh, we'll take a look at uh, what can be 
what can be done to improve this process and, and make it even better. And if people have those suggestions, I know that the, our Secretary of State is uh, all ears uh, after he gets this election done and certified to listen about how we can, how we can do it better. Okay, online. Hey, Jean, Williston, Harold. I'm gathering that the surveillance testing going to go through throughout the summer into the fall is intended to help identify the first spike. Is that a fair assessment? And will we, will we see a return in the fall of restrictions if there's a spike, or is the hope that surveillance testing will help us keep everything open? It's the, uh, for, it's the latter. We're trying to be proactive with the surveillance testing. We want to keep things open. We want to manage this thing through uh, testing, contact tracing, and very targeted uh, isolation. Uh, I know that some people even had concerns. I mean, we've heard from some business owners that have reached out to and said, hey, can we do testing for all of your team members? And they're like, hey, we're not sure. If we come up with one positive, we're worried that we might get shut down. That's not what is trying to happen. We're trying to keep things open. Uh, and so again, business owners, uh, they're, you know, your biggest asset is your team members, uh, making sure that they participate in, particularly if you've got congregate manufacturing facilities where you can't create the separation, can't reduce de density, people can't work from home. Uh, I would be, if I was running a manufacturing facility, I'd be on the front line saying, I, you know, please come work and let's get everybody tested so we understand our baseline. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the when we when we were in the the peak of this thing and we did get involved in the one uh, one in Grand Forks were shut down. I mean, we had over a hundred cases in a facility and we didn't know everything we were dealing with and we thought that we could, you know, hundred people in a facility that employed nine hundred. We, we we could have overwhelmed Grand Forks's healthcare capacity with one facility. Uh, that hasn't happened since then, and again, I think the surveillance testing makes sense for everything from you know bar owners to faith-based leaders to uh, you know to manufacturers. I mean, if you're uh, and if you're anybody with a concern, uh, you know, go get tested. That's what we would say. So we're trying to keep things open. That's what we're absolutely trying to do, Gene. But good question. Okay, who is next? Was it? Uh, I think it was Scott. It was not Scott, and then Jacob. So a question for you and then a follow-up for Dr. Connell uh, as well in just a moment. But uh, as the, with the business acumen you have, you have to understand the pain that restaurant owners have right now. Because even when anything, everything is quote-unquote normal, there's so now the new invention of social distancing that I've not heard anybody say could go away. So unless it does go away, their business model is upside down, right? They can only they have less people in their business. Uh, and still the same mortgage payments, still the same employee, you know, all, all of those things. I'm hearing a lot of them say, you know, I think five or six that are permanently closed in Fargo already, already permanently. So it's going to impact a lot of people. What, what's the, what, how do you, what would you do that? You, you, if, you're, if you had a chain of restaurants, what do you do when you have to uh, just redo everything differently? Well, I, I think, you know, every, this disruption has probably caused almost every business to rethink uh, and change some of their operating procedures and their business models. You know, restaurants is a difficult one. I'm sure, Scott, you know that if you just look statistically nationally, the, you know, the, the number one um, most vulnerable business model in America is a restaurant. It's the thing that everybody dreams of opening up their business and running a restaurant, and yet the, uh, you know, the closure rate of restaurants, even in good times, is among the highest in terms of turnover of restaurants. And as you say, when you get to a spot now, like we're at where the uh, guidelines are suggesting, you know, 75% capacity, uh, then uh, you got to change business models. I mean, I, I, but I've seen some very, very, uh, interesting things. They might have said if 75% of what you were on the inside, some of these people have added more than 25% of their capacity outside. You know, you buy a bunch of lawn furniture and you put up some, you know, you use your PPP dollars with the new flexibility that came in and all of a sudden you've got a, uh, and some of these are the same kind of, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're not, people are very forgiving right now. I mean, I saw one that was uh, well used and it was using the same, uh, uh, the same gates that you would have got at, at uh, you know, Fleet Farm or, you know, whatever. I mean, it, it was the same, uh, same brand, it's actually the same brand of uh, fences we had in our roping arena, you know, which is they just set them up outside, you know, they hung some, uh, uh, some, uh, 
posters on the outside of them that they probably got from one of their vendors, uh, put up some stuff, and all of a sudden they're serving, you know, burgers and beverages outside. Uh, a lot of people really were aggressive in advertising takeout uh, and home delivery. I mean, some people did a bang up business. Some people closed their doors and said, hey, I guess we can't do it the way we did. We're closed. Uh, and maybe that's tougher on fine dining. But I also know some biz some restaurants have thrived through this. So again, it, it some of it comes back to the, you know, individual entrepreneur. But I would say with the flex, if, if someone applied for that PPP plan, that's an enormous bridge. And the new Flexibility Act that came out last week, I mean, that's a huge boost. I mean, cover your cover your payroll uh, and, and give you additional capital to redo your business plan. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, there's, yeah, I mean, there's there's a path through for some, but uh, some, some, you know, certainly aren't going to make it during this time. And that's, but that's, uh, that's part of capitalism too. I mean, I feel bad, I feel bad, uh, certainly feel bad about you know businesses because those are dreams that are going away, but I felt bad about businesses that closed during good times too because particularly restaurants come and we all know they come and go. I don't know what the stats are in North Dakota, but uh, the if anybody is you know on the brink, I would say, uh, you know, call our Commerce Department. We are, we're working on plans and proposals. We got the new, the PPP from the feds, the Bank of North Dakota's got the loan program. We're working on some new ideas on, on sort of what we call COVID resiliency grants uh, that we're considering proposing as part of the next round of funding. So we wanna do everything we can to help people, uh, help people, you know, that, 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 are, that are open, get open and stay open and thrive going forward. And that's why we're, we're working so hard on trying to get the whole economy opened up because get consumer confidence back. We, consumer confidence back because what they they really don't want to hand out they need more customers they get more customers when we get consumer confidence so uh, us being optimistic about our ability to get through this thing and and uh, tackling the opportunities that come sometimes with more people uh, dining out in the summers uh, summer you know this is a good good time maybe we can people can actually see their businesses grow again I have talked to some retailers that had horrible March and Aprils they had super strong Junes and they're having an unbelievable super strong May and unbelievable Junes. So, I mean, there's a part of me that feels like things are coming back. The, the 2.5 million jobs that we were, we were talking about last Friday that were announced, that was statistically collected in the middle of May, not May 31st. That was May 15th, 2.5 million jobs have come back. So a lot of people talk doom and gloom in this country, but I'm more optimistic. I think, you know, talking to uh, people around our state, people are seeing activity come back and I, I remain optimistic. You know, got, and again, we got oil prices at 37 bucks. Uh, and, uh, you know, would like to see a four in front of that next, uh, keep that moving up. But the supplies are balancing there. So, uh, you know, some, uh, some wells that were shut in are coming back on again. I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about where we're, to, to where, where, where we're going. And I uh, <clears throat> love the job I have, but I love being an entrepreneur. And part of me wishes I was running a small business and figuring out how to, how to win through all this complexity. Because I think, there, I think there's, we're seeing a lot of really fun new approaches that people are applying. I know you have a question for Joan. And, uh, and, the, uh, and, and, and Mike, I didn't tell Mike Nowoski we we're having a, we we're going down to one a week, but then this one's gonna be five times longer. So that was what, that's why every, every answer is so long. So we're just, get it all at once. But anyway, Dr. Connell. My first Dr. Connell was related to the social distancing that is causing the economic pain uh, with the restaurants specifically because they can only use so much of their space. How long will we live with social distancing? Uh, Thanks for that question, Scott. And I just want to say that the Connell Jankowiak family is doing our part to stimulate the economy. Because uh, while I'm here, my husband has been taking a lot of extra call. <laughs> so we do a lot of takeout. <laughs> and it's working very well. Um, in answer to your question, when you think about what we know about COVID-19, which is certainly geometrically <laughs> increased compared to what we knew uh, just a few months ago, uh, we still understand that the best way to reduce the spread of disease is through social distancing and good hygiene. We're catching up on our science. Governor Burgum has talked a lot about our amazing increased capacity for testing, which is going to help us stay ahead of us of this pandemic. And the other thing that will be very useful is ready availability of treatments, and then finally, prevention of disease by vaccination. So uh, 
coming up with these plans to uh, carry some of these businesses through um, and to support the businesses the best we can while the science of treatment and prevention catch up with what our needs are is really the answer to this. And until then, we need to practice what we know, and that's social distancing and good hygiene. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Thomas Simon trending topics. Attendees at George Floyd protests or demonstrations uh, may not have been practicing the best social distancing, uh, have, but we haven't seen a a, an increase in cases yet. Are you concerned that um, the lack of attention to social distancing may lead to increased numbers? You know, as a mom and avid fan of soccer <laughs> players, um, I was really hopeful that the effects of UV light on this virus would be um, wonderful and actually uh, make outdoor play and activity uh, foolproof. Um, but we learned in the last week or so that a baseball team in our state has um, spread the virus throughout their team. Um, so we have to understand that that is um, still a possibility and we have to um, understand that close uh, communal activities and living are still a risk. Uh, so um, I, I, I encourage the First Amendment, but I also encourage it while social distancing. <laughs> Hey, Jacob. Uh, in reference to trying to boost those uh, testing numbers and testing capabilities, uh, is leftovers to Fargo just going to be the policy moving forward? I have to say for the first time in 60 days, I'm not sure I understand your question on the, 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 the that, leftovers. What does that mean? Leftover tests. You said you wanted to get the testing capacity up if we're not using them. Are we going to just send them to Fargo normally? No, I, I don't think that way. I'm, when I talk about the capacity, I mean, if we've now got the machines in place, the new Panther machines, the ability to do over 4,000 tests a day at the lab, plus we've got our partners, uh, Sanford and All True still has the ability to send some down to Mayo. Uh, so we've got uh, all of these, you know, testing options. But just even in the state lab itself, uh, the if we've got the capacity for 4,000, we're say only using 2,500 on a day. I just want to see us apply those either on surveillance testing or apply them like for visitors that want to get back into long-term care. Uh, it's a capacity that we should be using, uh, or whether it's uh, you know sports teams or. Uh, you know, athletes that are returning to the state, you know, college athletes. We've got a long list of places where we could be uh, doing more testing. And every time we test, we're going to learn some more stuff. We build our knowledge base and we go. So it's not all about, uh, it's not all to Cass County. But again, we're, if we've had uh, close to 80% of the positives in Cass County, uh, we, we've done less than 80% of the testing in the state in Cass County. So they're still, uh, they're still under a little bit relative to others, but that's, we do want to make sure that we're looking for prevalence. And so we pick the metro areas. We talked about Grand Forks, Bismarck, Minot, knowing that if we have drive-through testing and advertised, I mean, just when we did, when we did our first drive-through in Slope County, we had people from, from five counties and South Dakota and Montana show up. And so if we're picking these metro areas, we're going to hit a big swath. That, we're not just hitting four cities. We're hitting a big swath of the geography of the state. And we're probably hitting a, uh, you know, some more than 80% of the population if you just had four locations based on the catchment area of where people will voluntarily come in or they'll be in town for shopping or a game or visiting relatives and do that. So I, I think it's going to, those are gonna, for now, uh, that's where we're going to go on these Thursday, Friday surveillance testing, starting with Fargo, adding the other ones next week, and then we'll uh, learn more. And we're committed to do those uh, for a few weeks, and then we'll readjust as we always have after we get more learning. Okay, we're going to go Lane, if, we, if we've missed you already, or no, we got you once for but then on back to online. Governor, in the previous weeks when talking about unemployment, you've mentioned how you'd like to see North Dakotans get back to work. Uh, but there are still a lot sitting at home collecting all the benefits. That extra $600 is supposed to run out at the end of July unless they renew it. Um, is there anything that your office is planning on doing to help people 
get that extra income again when they do return to work, or is that kind of an unrealistic thing? Well, I think that the, uh, the like I've said before, we won't real, really know the unemployment rate in America until after July 31st because people are smart, and if you get paid more to not work than you can get paid to work, uh, then uh, you might figure out to do everything you can on how to earn the highest amount of income. Uh, from a consumer spending standpoint, having all that money in someone's pocket is not a bad thing. That could be one of the reasons why retail sales are so strong right now. Uh, it it is a uh, could be you know again great for the for many of the consumer facing businesses that want to get going. But it's not sustainable for the federal government to print money. Uh, we're, we're only in a position to do this as a country because, uh, and again, when we talk about being grateful that we're in the United States, there's only a few countries that actually have, uh, you know, when you've got a currency where at the federal level, not state level, but the federal level, and they can actually just print more money, uh, and do that, then then that's how we can fund the deficits at the federal level. So the the stimulus money that is you know coming out in the form of all of these activities, including you know paying people for unemployment, is not sustainable because there's there's no if there's no uh, uh, real economic activity under that underlies that, it's just not sustainable. Uh, my hope is that they would uh, see that. And, and then discontinue or at least modify whatever that thing is when it expires on July 31st, or I think it's actually gonna slow the economy coming back. It's gonna keep people uh, wanting to be unemployed versus working productively uh, in a business that's gonna do that. And I know that, again, I may have mentioned this early on, but uh, one of the, post-Katrina, they kept extending unemployment benefits for people in that area. And if you talk to the governors from those states, Mississippi, Louisiana, and other, it actually hurt the kind of businesses that Scott was asking about the restaurants because they couldn't get people to come back to work in those businesses because they could make more staying home. So uh, I think we got to get back to having the underlying the under underlying market forces uh, driving it as opposed to government subsidies because this is unsustainable in the long term for the government to do that, federal government to do that. Danny? Chris Larson, AM 1100, the flag, WZFG in Fargo. <laughs> uh, we're hearing from, we're hearing that beauticians and barbers are not yet allowed uh, in long-term care facilities in some cases. Under your amended executive orders, are are they allowed to enter the facilities? And if not, when do you anticipate seeing that happen? I got Chris Jones here, who's going to come on up and uh, take that question. Chris, thanks for being here. Thanks for all the work you're you're doing. And this is a question from Chris to Chris. And uh, Chris Larson is leading the resident uh, uh, advisory committee. And I wanna thank Chris Larson for all his work. I know that he's been uh, very active and passionate. Uh, and I know that Chris Jones has spent a lot of time visiting with him. So Chris to Chris, here's the question. My first answer is gonna be, I'm going to need to follow up to confirm this. Um, but what I would say is that we know when the in the previous, we don't want beauticians to come in and out. If they are just coming in and this is the only place that they go, that makes sense. But I I need to follow up with um, with Leslie Oliver in the governor's office just to make sure I understand how that works between assisted living, skilled nursing facilities, and basic care. Chris, can I ask you a follow-up question? Mm -hmm topic um, related to uh, nursing homes and uh, you know, long-term care facilities. It's been a big debate about this week. Obviously, a lot of families are understandably distraught and it's taking more time. Um, you talked today, the governor talked today about the, you know, some of the photos of, of, of the visitations that are happening outside. We had somebody today tell us it wasn't happening at their place. So uh, as far as you're concerned, outdoor visitation is 100% okay, right? It's just a matter of the facilities got to also be the ones that say, uh, yes, we'll do it and facilitate it. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and just to provide some more clarification, what, what we talked about last week is we are strongly encouraging facilities to do outdoor visitation with the appropriate precautions. If the facility is unable to do that or the family member thinks they should, they should still first work with the facility. If they can't work with the facility, there is the long-term care ombudsman program that you can access through the Department of Human Services to, to work through that. And they can help you navigate that process. And I think the other thing that becomes a part of this when we talk about vulnerable populations and sometimes they're served in different areas is the only areas that we have said that there are restrictions 
is skilled nursing facilities, basic care facilities, and assisted living facilities. All other facilities that provide health care have their own visitation policies. These are, the facilities are making their own visitor restrictions. These are not restrictions being imposed by the state. Now there are good reasons for facilities to do restricted visitation and they should not be blanket based on who is being served. So please work with your facilities and if you do have concerns, either call the Department of Human Services or start with the Department of Human Services and we can help you. Your peers um, were, were talking about what's happening in North Dakota versus what's happening in Alabama, or the governor's talking to you know Pete Ricketts and, and, and how you do Nebraska. I, I know people are still frustrated here, but you're, I think you've told me that it's we're doing it better than anybody. In other words, we're faster than anybody. Are, are, I mean, is there a way to benchmark that? Do you know that? Is there data out there? Yeah, so what we learned this morning is not only are we the only ones implementing a plan, we now believe we are the only ones who actually have a plan. So we are so far ahead of every other states in doing this visitation, and we are trying to thread the needle as it relates to balancing safety with the mental health of the residents being served. So we're being North Dakota smart, we are working with the facilities, we are working with the families, and we are trying to learn as we go. Thank you, Chris, and I would say thanks to Lindsay for going for an hour and a half. Way to go. And uh, <clears throat> since we're not gonna see Lindsay for another week, uh, when Dr. Connell was talking about vaccinations, you gave that little thing where, you, yeah, that one, that's the one right there, the, the shot in the arm. You guys may see that, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, we, we, I'm getting the signal uh, that we're uh, done for today. We'll see you next uh, Tuesday at 3.30. Thank you all for, uh, for being here and thanks for your questions.